ground, you know, where it's just sunk. And those are where the, the ground is thawing. Okay, it's thawing, and all that carbon gas that was in, you know, housed within these trees for years and years and years is being re-released into the uh, atmosphere. So that's what we're trying to preserve too. It's just that from being re-released into the atmosphere. Because we have the largest carbon sink in Canada and the second largest carbon sink in the world. And we're next to the Amazon and people don't know that. And it's like, so how do we keep that? How do we keep that frozen? And this project helps that. And you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, that's my science project for today, and um, I love a science talk. But again, you know, just keep an open mind. Keep an open mind when you listen. And you know, um, Troy's been at this for a while now, and um, I really, I've heard him speak before, and he speaks very well to this project. So, again, listen, and let us know what you think. And that's why we're here too, in a constructive way. You know, in a good way. And that's one thing that we have to, to keep open is this dialogue between me and you. But in a good way, you know, like come come talk to me in a good way. All right? You got to. Thanks, thank you. you guys can yell at me all you want, it's all good. You can be frustrated with me. Um, uh, again, so uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is uh, Troy Widows. I'm a descendant of the Fukutosh Indian band known as Flying Coast 73, uh, born and raised in Bullion, Ontario, so just west of Timmins. Uh, went to school, got a background in forestry, um, also uh, worked in the trades, uh, oil and gas, uh, built uh, some oil wells out west, and also a uh, locomotive engineer by trade. Uh, I've been uh, with Mishkigawa Council here going on two years. Uh, my role with the council is uh, assistant terrestrial manager. And uh, my main uh, project at the moment is the uh, Omish Kegel of and uh, we're trying to present this conservation initiative to our Mishkegawa communities and uh, inform you about this opportunity. So the project is called Omish Kegel Wakatulin, Omish Kegel Gagige, that means forever, uh, claiming stewardship of our lands and waters. Next slide. So we dedicate this work uh, to our elders, um, uh, life in the spirit of our brave and intelligent Korean Ojibwe treaty makers, our elders who cour courageously carried out the treaty bundle all their lives to correct uh, the wrongs and achieve the real agreement of uh, the treaty as orally agreed to. Thanks. So what is this conservation project? Uh, it's a conservation plan that will help strengthen and reaffirm our treaty rights. Uh, the treaty as it was written in English has allowed the government to override our rights to protect and uh, to protect our rights to the lands and waters. So this is an opportunity to create a new relationship with the government that will reaffirm the spirit and intent of the treaty and respect our rights to, as our ancestors that have envisioned. Um, we started this project because generations of leaders came together as one nation and told us to take action. Uh, many resolutions from the Council of Chiefs and from our assemblies of the Chicago Council dating back to 1989 has constantly told us to protect the lands and waters. Uh, now is the time to come together for this opportunity. Uh, million, millions of dollars are available right now from the federal government and other donors to help us protect our lands and waters. Uh, this money may not always be there though. If we, if we secure the money now, it could help create jobs and opportunities to keep our youth in the communities. It could help uh, with housing for people working in conservation. 
land-based activities for our people, all helping us reconnect to the land and water and live a good life. Our communities have seen a rapid growth in mining claims and the impacts of logging and agriculture on the land. Uh, working together as an Omishkego nation enables us to create stronger nation-to-nation -nation agreements. Uh, it helps us affirm control over the lands and our treaty, and uh, we must work together in unity to achieve this vision. Uh, like Natasha said, we're all family and we're all connected. Uh, each community will make its own decisions on all the agreements when it comes to this conservation plan. And uh, the council will be there to help and support you with uh, your plans moving forward. But each community uh, will decide for themselves on how they want their agreements uh, to proceed. Next slide. So last summer I was lucky enough to uh, attend the Chapel of Cree powwow and uh, this was a photo I took. So this is uh, the powwow grounds uh, for Chapel Cree First Nation. So this slide here just uh, gives you a brief outline of uh, the presentation I'm going to do for you today. Uh, the first segment is going to talk about uh, the oral promises of the treaty. Second will be securing the territory from our outside threats. Uh, the third component will be uh, strength and unity. And the fourth component will talk about the benefits of the conservation plan and uh, how, how it will affect you guys. Next slide. So your lands, your say. Each community needs to come up with their own plan for their lands. Uh, this means identifying areas you would want to protect and conserve, and also identifying areas where economic development may occur. Uh, this is not the first conservation project like this in Canada. Uh, this project is called the PFP, that's uh, Project Finance for Permanence. And uh, we can learn from these other projects that have PFPs uh, across Canada. We can use them as guidelines and best practices to implement our own conservation plans. <clears throat> if we reach an agreement in principle by the summer, uh, that will uh, activate a 10-year implement implementation phase for a community conservation plan. So we must work together to achieve this and we th feel the best way moving forward is uh, a united approach. And the council will be there to help support each community. It was the uh, Chicago Council who approached the government for this opportunity, saying our people want to protect the lands and waters. Uh, many resolutions from the council and uh, from our chiefs of the assembly of the Chicago Council uh, since 1989 have told us to protect the lands and waters. By doing this work, we honor our ancestors and ensure the way of life and our culture is preserved for the next generations to come. So this project is a tool to help implement the real treaty as orally agreed to by our ancestors. It will advance our inherent rights as we understand them, protect the lands and waters, and each nation will retain their own decision making with the project. And this uh, beautiful artwork here is done from a Mishkegawak member, John Rubin. So the James Bay Treaty. The treaty as it was written down in English has allowed governments to override our rights to protect and use the lands and waters as we see fit. Today we are better equipped to protect our rights and negotiate with the crowns. Um, the James Bay Treaty, also known as Treaty No. 9, is an agreement between the Cree, the Ojibwe, and other indigenous nations uh, with the crowns. Another thing about Treaty 9 is that it was actually signed by uh, the federal government and the provincial government. So both uh, federal and provincial governments have a duty to uphold the treaty as orally agreed by our communities. And uh, the little map to the right just shows uh, all the communities in uh, uh, the signatory times of 1905 and 1906 when the uh, treaty was signed. Next slide. More mining and exploration in agriculture are coming to the territory without our consent. Uh, people are eyeing the lands again for critical minerals. Uh, they're looking at our wood and power and uh, food pr production without consulting our communities. So our communities have seen a rapid growth in the mining claims, logging and agriculture, having cumulative impacts on development of our lands and negatively impacting our treaty rights. 
Uh, every day it seems like there's uh, more land and water that is being taken up by the government and uh, private companies with no end in sight. This slide here uh, kind of gives you a good visual of what uh, what is going on in the area. So if you look at the top right monitor, you can see TTN there. And uh, basically all the color on here are different activities that are happening on the land. Uh, the orange are all mining claims within the area. Uh, the red uh, pixels you see on here are uh, forests, forests that were harvested, are planned to be harvested from uh, 2022 to 2032. Uh, the yellow blocks that you can kind of see just mixed within uh, the forestry sector are, are blocks that are sprayed uh, with uh, glyphosate. So that's basically uh, what they use. Uh, they, the glyphosates kill all the, the deciduous trees and it allows for uh, the pine trees to grow up. And then also in the red, we have blocks that have been harvested from uh, 2010 to 2021. So you can tell by this map just alone here that uh, there's a lot of activities happening in the area, whether it's mining, uh, forestry, and this map doesn't depict all the agriculture that's happening too. I mean, I'm sure you guys are well aware of that, but every time I'm driving down Highway 101, it seems like there's a, a new farm happening and, and uh, lo lots, of ha lots of things happening in the area that creates these accumulative effects. Next slide. So forestry and spraying. Our conservation plan aims to identify and protect 75,000 square kilometers of boreal forest in our southern region. Uh, Clear-cutting clear and uh, planting back monocrops for lumber mills negatively impacts the ecosystems and the animals that depend on it. Uh, moose populations are on the decline with other animals we depend on. Uh, current forestry practices also put the community at risk for fires. Uh, I'm sure you guys uh, seen that all last uh, last summer. Huge fires happening in the province, and uh, these clear cuts and monocrops basically just act as tinder boxes uh, for the bush to go up. The boreal is naturally a mixed forest, so poplar, birch, and aspen they help kind of suppress fires. So as we keep cutting our, our forests and just planting pine trees, it allows for bigger, stronger fires uh, to kind of burn. Next slide. So uh, the use of non-essential herbicides have been linked to cancer. Uh, the Meshkigawak Council, along with other Meshkigawak communities, have uh, signed banned council resolutions stating that they do not want them to use on their land or territory. Uh, it can take up to seven years for berries and medicines to grow back after a block's been sprayed. Um, also, uh, when these blocks are sprayed, a lot of that habitat is uh, deciduous trees, so prime, prime feed for moose. So, you know, our moose population goes into these blocks and uh, they also eat uh, these trees and leaves that have been sprayed. And we're hearing stories of moose livers having spots or meat getting contaminated. So all these practices deteriorate our, our tree rights and it deteriorates our health. Um, in Quebec, uh, they banned these uh, non-essential herbicides over 20 years ago. So that's only 100 kilometers away across the border. These, these chemicals are banned. And uh, our communities keep asking them to, to stop the spray, but uh, with these conservation plans, we can take control of our lands and forests and help uh, implement uh, new procedures that are more suited for, for uh, better ecosystems and a healthier plant and forest uh, for our community members to utilize. Next slide. So this slide is about dams. Uh, Currently in Ontario, there's over 40 dams and water control, control structures in Ontario. So that's 40 rivers that have multiple dam sites or water control areas that, uh, that are on, on the land. Uh, the Moose River Basin has been heavily impacted by cumulative effects of development and climate change. So this conservation program can uh, give us the ability to protect our rivers and lakes and help restore the watersheds that uh, we need for a healthy ecosystem. So, we keep hearing with our project about uh, the Grand Canal Scheme. Uh, with this conservation plan and our MMCA conservation plan up on the James Bay Co Coast, that's a National Marine Conservation Area, there will never be a Grand Canal Scheme. 
And uh, to the left side here, this is a band council resolution that dates back to 1986, uh, signed by George Hunter, stating that, you know, the Mishkegawak people will never allow the, the James Bay to be dammed. So uh, part of our conservation efforts, separate from uh, the Omishkego Wakatoan, is the Tawich uh, NMCA. And uh, that's moving along quite well. So if that uh, conservation initiative is passed, uh, that will stop any plans for a Grand Canal scheme, offshore trolling, uh, oil drilling uh, in the bay, and uh, it'll just definitely protect all the wildlife that uh, that is rich in abundance in the bay. Like uh, Lawrence was saying, we have three to five million birds stop over in the bay for nesting. Uh, we have you know, all our uh, life in there. Lots of animals are caribou's utilizing the coast polar bear. So. Uh, we definitely want that also to be protected and then to, to marry up with our Omish Giggle Wakatoan. Uh, we're hoping that eventually we'll get a good buffer zone along the coastline also and then carry on our conservation uh, through the peatlands down into the boreal forest. Next slide. So this picture here is a picture of the Eagle Nest mine site located in uh, the Ring of Fire. So mining plane numbers have surged, especially in that area, and uh, it's just the constant need as you know climate changes, as other resources are taken up around the world. Uh, everybody keeps eyeing Northern Ontario for for development and mineral extraction and power supplies. Next slide. So this slide here is uh, going to depict kind of uh, the mining claims. This is 1980. 2002. So as you'll see here, the, the blobs keep changing. These are all increases of mining development. And you can see up in the far corner as the years progress, how these claims just keep popping up more and more in the territory. And you'll notice up in the ring of fire here, you can see it right in the center, how it just keeps getting more and more developed. Well, traditionally, you used to have to literally stake a quarter mile. So guys would line up in the bush, stake a, a pin, and you'd have to run a quarter mile, stake another claim, put your tag on it, run another quarter mile, stake a claim, and you would literally run through whatever the train was. And the first person to complete that square mile got the claim. Uh, a couple of years ago, though, uh, there was new legislation that passed that now you can do mining claims electronically over the internet. So now that anybody on a computer can just do a mining claim in a territory, it doesn't help the situation where you used to have to say take a helicopter up, up to the coast, you'd have to drop the crew up there, they'd have to physically run that claim and, and stake it. But uh, now with new, new regulations and laws, you can do that electronically through your computer. So that just goes to show how, how that has progressed. You get a conservation plan in your area, you protect all your homelands, and you take control of the territory. southern communities, there's not much old growth forest left. They've been logging here, you know, since the early 1900s. So a lot of the, the work that will have to be done in our southern communities is restoration. Um, uh, and this is not going to be the council making these decisions about your land. It's going to be about the nations making uh, their individual decisions how they want to do the conservation uh, projects. So our communities that have seen the rapid growth in mining claims, the impacts on logging and agriculture of the lands, and uh, working together with the Omish Gatewalk Nation enables us to create stronger nation and nation agreements. Uh, it helps us affirm the control over our lands and territory. So uh, we've got to work together in unity to achieve this vision. Again, the Omish Gatewalk are all family and we're all connected.
So there's now an opportunity to secure the territory from outside threats. Um, today, there's over $100 million that have been committed from the federal government to help implement our conservation plans for our PFP. Uh, there's also more money uh, that will be coming from private donors for this project who are committed to the Indigenous-led vision of our conservation plan in Omishkegawak territory. Um, we're also looking at a whole of government approach to secure more funds needed to fully envision the conservation plan uh, as we see it. So ideally, if uh, everything were to go to plan how the council kind of envisioned it and how communities decide, we're looking to secure about uh, 300,000 square kilometers of conservation area. So roughly that would be about 86,000 square kilometers of uh, the coastline. So that's from the Manitoba border all the way to the Quebec. Uh, in the peatlands, we'd be looking to secure about uh, 130,000 square kilometers. And then in our southern regions, in the boreal forest, about 75,000 square kilometers. But uh, the money that's up there right now is, was put up by the current government, and uh, that funding might not always be in place. That's why we're trying to uh, reach uh, an agreement and principle here by the end of the summer. Sorry. So it's a new opportunity. Victor here is uh, our grand chief with uh, our uh, Prime Minister, uh, our leaders told the government that we wanted to protect our lands and waters. Uh, the Omishkego territory is our home, but it also plays a critical role in stabilizing the world's uh, climate. Uh, it's home to iconic species like the caribou, the sturgeon, the polar bear, the moose, the beloved moose, about 3,000 trillion mosquitoes. Um, it's also the nesting grounds to about three to five billion migratory birds. Um, the peatlands absorb, uh, like Natasha was saying, they sequestrate carbon, so the peatlands actually absorb five times more carbon than the Amazon rainforest. You probably heard that growing up in school, they teach you, oh, we can't cut down the Amazon forest, or, you know, we're going to destroy the planet. Our peatlands absorb five times as much carbon per square kilometer as the Amazon forest. And uh, also, like Natasha was saying, uh, it's the second largest peatland complex in the world. Uh, there's estimates of about 30 billion tons of carbon that's stored in the peatland. But once that peat is dug up or disturbed or it starts to thaw, those emissions go back into the atmosphere, which can kind of just speed up climate change. So the territory that uh, the Omishkegawa call home is so critical to the whole world, not just our own people, and, and the government recognizes that. So part of that opportunity, uh, they announced uh, I COP15 was, uh, Mishkegawa Council was chosen as a potential recipient for the PFP. So Canada is trying to conserve 30% uh, of the country for conservation by 2030. And they know to make this happen that they need to, to work with our First Nation communities. We're the true right holders to the land. So that's how the Mishkegawa uh, leaders approach the government saying, you know, our people want to protect our lands and territories and uh, let's make this happen. So what you see on the right here, that just kind of blurted it out, is a letter from the Ministry of Environment. So we keep hearing from the past, uh, you know, there used to be conservation areas where game wardens would come in and tell you you can't hunt or practice your treaty rights. You know, they stop on bird nests. They're just ignorant and rude to our people. They didn't respect our treaty rights. So this is kind of a letter just reaffirming to uh, to our people the commitment to uh, the federal government. So I'll just read uh, a couple of excerpts from it. So Parks Canada is committed to honoring and upholding the Omishkegawa people uh, rights to harvest by hunting, trapping, gathering, and fishing as they have for millennia. Uh, this commitment will be demonstrated through our work together on the National Marine Conservation Area, also as the project finance Permanent initiative, and that's the uh, Omishkegawa Wakatoma we're talking about. Uh, indigenous people have uh, consistently expressed that uh, practices of the land that we are necessarily a part of exercising inherent rights and stewardship responsibilities. Supporting these practices is one way that Parks Canada can help the Government of Canada commitments to a renewed relationship with Indigenous people and to implement the, the United Nations Declaration of Rights and Indigenous uh, Peoples Act. So that's what this slide kind of tries to reiterate is that 
the government today uh, does see that they truly want to kind of take a, a proper step forward with truth and reconciliation and uh, start honoring our treaty rights in our territory. Next slide. There's a real nice picture here. So, uh, Senator, there is uh, the next Prime Minister here probably in a couple of years, uh, Natasha Martin. Uh, we also got uh, Premier of Ontario here, Doug Ford, and then uh, uh, Minister Rickford. So this slide here is uh, to let you know that we are having positive conversations with the Ontario government. And these, these conservation efforts have also helped us deal with other issues that we, we need in our communities. And it's helping in conversations on treaty rights, on our conservation and resources, and we just know that these conversations happen when we're united. We're stronger when we're united as one voice, and that allows each nation and nation to then negotiate their own agreements or terms with uh, the province and the federal government. Next slide. So there's strength and unity. Uh, this helps our nation and nation relationship and honors the past work of our ancestors. Uh, the Old Mishkegel people are family and we're connected to each other in the land. Uh, so pictures of the right are just paying homage to all of our uh, former uh, Grand Chiefs that have done a lot of work uh, for the people. And Mishkegel Council is in a really unique way. Because you guys elect your own uh, council, you have a, a, a Grand Chief, uh, a Northern Grand Chief, Deputy Grand Chief, and a Southern Grand Chief. You guys are in control of your own kind of electoral process that's separate from the Indian Act. So the Mishkegel Council is actually, you know, the true voice of the old Mishkegel people and who they want for their leadership. I'll play you a quick video here for the next slide. So I don't know if our PowerPoint uh, enables our audio here, but we have it written down. But this is uh, TTN Elder, basically. Uh, we'll just replay that again, Jordan. We were here last summer doing some mapping, talking about our plan, and uh, Elder Garfield Marcus is basically telling us that, you know, we just don't need TTN uh, to be under conservation. We know we need the whole Mishkegawak territory. So that's just uh, him uh, letting us know what he wanted for our conservation plan. He needs, uh, he wants the whole area protected. And uh, you were asking how we stop these mining claims. We protect the land and territory. So that was a video of uh, one of our visits uh, last summer uh, when you guys were having your AGA. We'll let it play one more time just to read him. Thanks, Jordan. We'll go to the next slide. So now we kind of want to get into some of the benefits that uh, can be had from our conservation initiative and, and how this will actually benefit our community members. So healthy source of food for the lands and the waters. You know, our people depend on, on the lands and the waters. So, uh, we sustain ourselves with our food. You know, we, we, we catch the fish from the lake, we harvest our goose, we hunt the caribou. Part of this conservation plan is uh, having control of the territory. If, if we put an area up uh, for conservation, we can create our conservation authorities, which then uh, you know, enhances your treaty rights. You can uh, identify areas where there would be no hunting allowed or certain areas where you know, only TTN members could potentially hunt. You can basically implement your plan any way you see fit. I know you guys got a lot of community members that have worked within the, the MNR, so you guys, you know, could, could lean on community members to implement basically your own vision or conservation, uh, how you want to have your food security. Uh, some more benefits. So this picture here is uh, uh, the Wakatoan Development Group. So that's uh, based out of Chapel Cree, Missinaba Cree, and uh, Brunswick Hills. And these are their guardians, part of their guardian programs. 
So part, uh, part of this conservation plan is uh, new land-based uh, jobs uh, and it'll help uh, create uh, housing, keeping our youth at home and giving them a reason to stay. So I got to visit uh, Chapel Creek. I was there the last uh, two days and they were doing a moose hide tanning session and that was put on by their guardianship programs and it must have been about 20 or 30 community members that came through and they were uh, just showing the youth and the elders how to traditionally uh, tan a hide and they were all guardian employees that uh, they worked. So those were all youth from the communities that are now there for the summer. And uh, speaking with the youth, they're, they're pumped to have these jobs. They're jobs that are tailored to our community members. And uh, it's exciting, they're going to school, they're getting degrees in environment, conservation, and now they're being able to go back to community and actually implement those tools and, and teach their, their family members, their brothers and sisters about what they've learned and they have jobs that keep them at home. So more benefits are land-based healing camps. So like everywhere, you know, drugs and alcohol are running rampant across Canada. We need uh, outlets for our community members to heal. So part of our initiative is making land-based healing camps where they can learn uh, traditional uh, teachings, uh, learn about their spirituality, cultural teachings. Uh, also, we're looking to create multi-use centers. So each community would have a multi-use center where they could create uh, programs, run activities, uh, do uh, moose high tanning sessions, whatever communities want or would see fit for their multi-use centers. We're looking to get one in each community for a conservation plan. Uh, monitoring stations for communities. So that would enable us to start monitoring our own waterways. We can set up uh, animal tracking stations in the bush and we can just really start keeping an eye on our, our waterways, our land, and have that data for ourselves. And it creates jobs for community members to, to stay home. Also part of it is greenhouses and gardens. So that's just, again, touching on food security. Uh, more in our northern communities, access to you know, fresh vegetables and good produce is, is hard to come by and the prices are just ridiculous. So we're hoping with this conservation plan to get greenhouses in each community and create these circular economies. In our southern regions, more agriculture keeps coming up. So you know there's opportunities and new emerging economies for us to, to get into farming. And, potentially provide food to our northern communities and, and right across Canada. So there's a lot of opportunities in, in this region here for farming. We're in a, a rich farming area, the clay belt, and with the warming of the climate and new technology, the area is becoming more viable for, for farming and food solutions. Uh, another benefit from the program is going to be equip, equipment and vehicles. So we'll need equipment to do our monitoring. We'll need boats, we'll need quads, skidoos. So all this could be purchased through our conservation program to allow uh, monitoring and guardian programs to have the tools they need to make sure uh, you know nobody's poaching on the land. They have equipment to get out there to, to monitor the rivers, to, to check up on the forests and all that stuff. Next slide. Other uh, main benefits that are really important are the preservation of the language and culture. So, you know, we keep hearing, you know, we got to gain our knowledge from our elders. We got to utilize our elders' teachings. So this conservation plan will allow for funding to, to extract that knowledge from our community members. Uh, we can run language classes in our community centers. Uh, we can do cultural teachings, uh, anything community sees fit, just to preserve our way of life and to ensure those teachings are passed on to future generations. Uh, there's also going to be mentor ship and wellness programs so I keep hearing like there's implementation phase at this point we're just looking to see if communities agree to putting their area up for conservation and we need to get the federal government and the provincial government on board but then there's going to be a, an implementation plan to set up your conservation area to set up your, your program so there's time for mentorship and uh, educating our children and our grandchildren to be ready to take these jobs or you know potential community members want a career change they're tired of working in a mine underground we can get them trained up to have a, a, a conservation job potentially as maybe a, a seal officer on the land or other opportunities they may be interested in so 
So this slide here, I'm just going to play you uh, a little video here. Again, I think our audio isn't uh, connected, but this is a video about the breathing lands. It just depicts basically the Mishkegwak territory and how vast it is, all the animals uh, and how it's needed. Uh, we got uh, Sam Hunter speaking about how it's basically the Serengeti of the north, that there's animals everywhere, that it should be protected, that it's the lungs of the universe. Uh, we have our director, Lawrence Ma Martin, talking about how the birds need this area for nesting and how it's important. And then uh, ex-Grand Chief, Deputy Grand Chief Friday, explains that it's the lungs and it's uh, the, the, the lungs of the world and without it, you know, we're going to be in trouble. So that's what this video depicts and I could share some links or we'll try to figure out the audio for tonight's presentation. But uh, this was done uh, by the Water Brothers, it's called The Breathing Lands and it's actually an episode on TV that you can look and it's all about the peatlands and the old Meshkigwak territory and how the area is so important to just not our people but the whole world. So that's what this video was depicting. So I'm gonna talk, see a quote from our current uh, Grand Chief Leo Friday. Uh, the Omishkego Wakatoan is a step that we can take together to confront the challenges that our communities and our lands face. Uh, we can benefit from a harmonious balance between economic development and protecting our natural environment. Uh, together we have a future with healthy communities, healthy people, and a healthy environment. Um, also, that what you guys would have been passed around is our draft conservation plan. That's basically a more detailed plan of how these conservation efforts can work. They go into kind of full details of job opportunities, uh, scope, but it's just a draft. It's just kind of a, a, a vision of what conservation would be. Uh, we want to hear input from you guys, feedback, what you like, what you don't like. And then again, each community will be able to decide exactly how they want to implement their conservation plan. And uh, the council will be here to help support. And through this process, the 10 year phasing plan, we're thinking about year one to five is all land use planning. So it's identifying what areas you could want for conservation. In those years, we're building up capacity. We're getting community members trained up. We're starting guardian programs. And then uh, to fully implement the whole vision, and to get the areas uh, conserved is, could be sped up, but it's roughly a 10 year plan. So there, there's lots of time to make sure we're doing it right. And uh, that every step of the way, we're, we're consulting experts, we're talking to our elders, we're talking to community members, and uh, there's time to get people trained up so that they're ready to fully implement this plan and, and be ready to do the jobs that are needed. Um, we have contact information for the council. Uh, we'll handle cards. We'll be doing another presentation tonight uh, for the community from 5 to 8. So if you guys want more information, I recommend you come down. We'll have a couple draws and uh, some more swag. And that's my presentation. So we'll open the floor for some uh, questions if anybody has any.